All right. Last Thursday, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That's a great promise to claim. We need to memorize that. And when you're going through a rough time, thank you, Lord, for Romans 8, 28. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 58, last verse, I think, well, I think it's the last verse in the 15th chapter. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. steadfast. What's that mean? Standing firm. Yes, stay in standing firm. Stay in the battle. Don't, don't, don't give up. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Immovable. Immovable. Yeah, you, you can't be moved. You're, you're going to stand firm in His truth, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's another wonderful one to, to claim. It's another promise. If we, it's a command and a promise. Be steadfast and immovable is a command. Abounding in the work of the Lord is a command. Knowing that the, in the Lord your labor is not in vain is a promise. It's a wonderful promise. Thank you, Lord. It's not in vain. It's not wasted. So much of what we do in this life is wasted. <laughs> We're all included. We, know we all do this. Uh, and I'm, I want to be careful. It's not wasting yourself to get rest and recreation. That's an important part of life. Don't misunderstand me. But God created us to need rest. So it's okay uh, to do things like that. But so many things we do, I think we'll look back and say, my goodness, I wasted a lot of, a lot of time doing something that's not going to count for an eternity. So Lord, help me to use my time more. There's, a, there's some more, more efficiently. There's a verse that says redeeming the time. Redeeming the time is a good way to put it. It's what God puts it. And then today's verse. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yeah. Very familiar verse. The, the thing I think we need to keep reminding ourselves here is God decides what my needs are. I may think I know what my needs are, but often I don't. I know what I think my needs are. And God's very pleased for me to bring those to him. When I say, Lord, I really need this, you know, whatever it might be. I need money to pay my bills or I need uh, health right now. I'm not feeling so well. Or, Lord, I need uh, people to understand me a little better than they do. People who don't understand me. And, Lord, I need them to understand me. And, and the Lord may be teaching me things through all of that. Sometimes he uses financial need to teach us some things about how we use our finances and sometimes he teaches us uh, when we're sick to just wait on him and to trust him. I remember one time it's been many years ago now but I had a you know there, there are colds they're just kind of cold you know just we all get them all the time and then every once in a while you'll get a really really miserable cold you know what I mean <laughs> where you just feel you've got the you know it's not the flu but you just you just feel yucky and you just ah you just feel like this is awful, and I remember going through that one time and I was saying Lord would you please take this away and of course He did take it away eventually, but between the time I was praying and the time it happened I said I know you got some lessons for me to learn and and He reminded me of people who for example who suffer the rest of their lives there are people who suffer for decades you know but, but with different kinds of pain and ailments and I didn't have to do that and so I, that was something to be thankful for. he reminded me of that because he didn't heal me of the cold quite so quickly he reminded me that uh, that when I'm feeling rotten it's a good time for me to spend some extra time with him just looking to him reading his word concentrating on him trying to draw near learning how to overcome the difficulties and the resistance and that kind of stuff so so sometimes our need is different than we think he knows what our real needs are but he will supply all of our real needs according to his riches and glory. And, of course, when we think of riches, we think of money. And, yes, God's got all the money in the world. He's, it all belongs to him. But he's talking about everything, you know, his, all, his, all his ability, all his power, all his wisdom, all his grace, you know, riches and of all of these things. Uh, he, 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 he uses those to provide for our needs. So that's a great promise, too. It's an awesome promise. My God shall supply all your needs. So when you feel like you really have a need, Lord, you're my... You remember his compound name? Jehovah. Jireh, my provider. You're my provider. Lord, you're, you, provide, you supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. Jehovah Jireh, thank you. So it's a great, great verse. Okay. I know we can memorize this one quickly. But my God, but my God, but my God shall supply all your need. Shall supply all your need according to... His riches in glory by Christ Jesus.
Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, for being willing to do that. Thank you. Yes. And I hope more of you are doing it in your hearts. I'd like for more of you to speak up, but I know it can be a little confusing, but I really appreciate Lizzie being willing to. And Katie would be, except she's all messed up with her sinuses right now, so she's having a rough time. Okay. Um, anything you want to mention before we pray? You're going to pray for fall break. You know, you got tests today for the last day. Some of you have. Okay, I'll pray for that. Um, pray for Katie to get the feeling better. Pray for Taylor. Yes, and Katie. For your mom and your and your friend in Florida, yeah, boyfriend, yeah, okay, and his family, and everything. okay, okay, yeah, okay. We got some, well, sort of friends. We got people we know down, and not we don't really we're not really close to them, but people we know, and I haven't heard from them yet either. So I'm eager to hear what's happened there. Okay, anything else you want to mention before we pray? Okay, we're all cool. Yes. Okay. I'll wait. That's okay. Okay. Stressing a bit, a little bit. Yeah. You got to do, got to do it right first time. Yeah. Okay. I'll help you pray about that too. Aren't you thankful for classes like this one? <laughs> you don't have any tests. <laughs> yes. All right. Are you ready to pray? Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. You are good. And thank you for your promises, Lord. So many wonderful promises in your word. And we've been able to look at one of them today. Thank you that you said you would provide all of our needs and supply all of our needs, Jehovah Jireh, according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, by Christ Jesus. Lord, we know it's all because of what Jesus did for us on the cross that we get to be your kids and get to have all of our needs met by you. And Lord, we confess to you that many times we think we have needs that are not real needs. You know what our real needs are. Lord, we're often interested in comfort. <laughs> we're often interested, Lord, in things just kind of going our way for today and for this moment and this time we're in. And Lord, we know you're interested in preparing us for eternity. And sometimes our interests and your interests don't quite match up. But your interests are right and best. And we know one of these days we'll look back from your perspective and we'll be so glad that uh, you prepared us for eternity by allowing us sometimes to experience things and go through things that were kind of unpleasant for us, maybe very unpleasant, and yet you were using them to teach us valuable lessons and meeting our needs, our spiritual needs, in, in ways that were hard for us to understand. So help us to trust you in these things. Even when we feel like you're not meeting our needs, help us to trust you that you really are. Teach us to wait on you. Teach us to look to you. Teach us to, to, uh, to remember that you love us more than we possibly could have ever imagined. And that you have an incredible purpose and plan that you are working out in our lives. Father, a lot of immediate situations here that we feel a need for. I know I'd, I'd, I'd like to, I, I kind of hurt with Katie this morning as she struggles with these sinus infections. I pray you'd heal her quickly. And, and then I pray for, uh, uh, that's Katie White I'm talking about. Lord, you know who I'm talking about. But I pray for Katie Hubbard too. And her mother, I uh, pray for Annette. I pray for her boyfriend in Florida and, and others in Florida, Lord, who are, uh, trying to flee this hurricane or maybe half fled and it's gone by now and left a mess behind. So I pray you'd give people great grace and wisdom, especially those first responders and caregivers who are trying hard to help people get resettled and, and get their lives back together after all of this. And Lord, I pray you'd help people to make wise decisions. I know there's still a lot of danger down there, so please be merciful to people and help them out. be wise and uh, protect them. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Taylor, that you'll heal her up quickly, her leg, and if she's got other injuries, and bring her safely back to us after the break, maybe, and uh, just to be merciful to her. Thank you so much for sparing her life in that accident. So, uh, Lord, it reminds us of how fragile life can be, and I uh, pray we would all keep that in mind. We know that this life can end at any time, unexpectedly sometimes, and I pray that we will just keep our focus on you realizing that you've really not designed these bodies to last forever that they have to be given up at some point in time and when they do when we do have to give them up lord help us to to just trust you with that you said you would carry us all the way through even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death you would be with us and we thank you lord that eventually we're going to be with you in eternity in brand new glorified bodies so we thank you for that promise and that assurance and we look forward to that Pray for these kids as they get ready for tests. Got, got a big chemistry test and some other tests today, Lord, that are going to be challenging, difficult.
And, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of stress going on. I pray you give them some peace, help them just to take a deep breath and be able to relax and think clearly and do the best they can on the test and remember the things they've learned and not make careless mistakes and, and just do their best for you and leave it in your hands. So just help them, Lord, as they go through this day. And then, Father, for the people who are traveling and for those of us who are not traveling for the next couple of weeks, I pray that we will bring you a lot of glory during uh, fall break, that we will be conscious of your presence and spend some time in your word, spend some time in small group Bible study, spend some time talking with friends about you and your word and your truth, and spend some time with you just maybe getting some wisdom from you, some direction from you as we seek to grow stronger in Jesus. Um, Lord, I suspect I may have left some things out that I need to be praying for, but uh, I thank you that you hear our requests even when they just come out of our hearts and uh, don't go through my mouth. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for uh, what we're learning here about spiritual warfare, and I pray that as these kids learn how to put on the belt of truth, Lord, I know the enemy would like to snatch this away. You told us, you gave us a parable one time in your word about, about how your word goes out as seed and that many times the seed gets spread around and the word gets out, but the enemy takes it away before it ever takes root so it doesn't bear fruit. And I know that can easily be the case in a course like this where all they have to do is sit here and listen. But I pray just as they would be sitting in a Sunday school class or a worship service listening, that they will try to listen with their hearts and minds open, that they will try to stay teachable and learn as much as they can uh, and maybe put into practice some of these things they're learning about effective spiritual warfare. Thank you that you've given us a belt of truth. Thank you that your belt of truth will protect us from Satan's lies. Lord, he is such a crafty, subtle liar. Uh, he's good at it, and he's deceived so many people, Lord, around the world. And he will even deceive your kids if we don't keep that belt of truth on. He'll deceive us about you, Lord. He'll lie to us about you. He'll lie to us about ourselves. He'll lie to us about our sin. He'll lie to us about the world we're living in. He, he just lies about so many things. But Lord, I thank you that you've given us a belt of truth. So we want to keep your truth clearly in our heads and in our hearts so we can stand firm against the, the enemy as you've commanded us to in Ephesians chapter 6. So I pray you teach us today as we continue to put on the belt of truth uh, to, to internalize this and learn it well and use it and be stronger and better equipped to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Long prayer. Uh, a lot of my prayers are. Um, let's see. Did Autumn come in? No. Uh, and uh, and Anna didn't come in either, did she? All right, uh, I want to give you a handout here. I told you yesterday I would uh, I do this so many times, it's amazing. I will have something in my hands ready to give you. There it is. Uh, this has got two sides, and it kind of fits what I was talking about yesterday. So uh, you may want to keep this and, and use it to help you put on the belt of truth. Katie, would you take one, pass them around? And Jackson, would you take one, pass them around? You're staying awake, aren't you, Jackson? Jackson? Jack, you're staying awake? Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, all right. Here are the questions for part four. We're still putting on the belt of truth, so take one, pass those around too. Thank you. Everybody should get two different sheets. One of them says putting on the belt of truth about God in big letters over the top. The other one says questions only. So take one of those and pass them around too. Yes. Okay, before we look at this video, let me just go over these questions. Everybody got questions now? See the questions in front of you? Okay. Let me look, make sure I'm looking at the right one. Yeah. How much of Steve's account about his encounter with a Ridgecrest teacher can you remember? I've got a story on the video. I'm just seeing if you can remember the story. 
Number two, what's the point of his sharing that account? Number three, what are some common lies of Satan regarding our sin? Number four, what are some truth about sin that we could pray back to God as far as putting on the belt of truth? Number five, what's the verse in 1 John that promises us God's forgiveness when we confess our sins? Number six, what are two possible implications for the word testimony? Number seven, what's the problem with the self-esteem movement? You'll see it's one of my pet peeves. I talk about it a lot. Number eight, where in his word does God indicate that our testimony is an important part of our overcoming Satan? Number three, what three things, number nine, what three things are mentioned in that verse that give us victory over the devil? Number 10, 31 things were mentioned in this video that God says are true about us as his kids. How many of them can you remember? And I'm, I've got a list of them. I'll hand them to you after the video is over. But see, I'm, see, just try to concentrate on some of these things. You can't remember them all, but try to get at some of them. Number 11, how do some people identify themselves as Christians get confused about the promises of God's power in us? Number 12, what's the real purpose of God's power in us? Number 13, can you remember the gist of any of the verses that relate to God's power in us? And I've got a whole bunch of verses there. That you may get some of them. Number 14, what's the common error about answered prayer that goes along with the same error about God's power in us? Number 5, why is prayer so powerful? Number 16, 27 passages were used in the video to communicate God's truth about prayer. Can you remember any of them? And I've got a another handout on prayer that I may not have printed yet. I'll have to give it to you after the break. So, there we go. Okay, so that's kind of an overview. Thank you very much. Everybody, everybody got two handouts now? Okay. Um, let's see. And Carly, if you'd flip the lights off for me, please. Thank you. Well, hey guys, we've reached video number four in our spiritual warfare series. And we're still learning how to put on the belt of truth. You know, I'm not sure whether I've shared what I'm about to share with you yet. I may have. If I have, just chalk it up. Do I be in a forgetful old man who repeats himself a lot? You're used to those kind of people, aren't you? <laughs> but in the 1970s, I served for a few years as Minister of Education at First Baptist Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. And every year we took a large number of our Sunday school leadership to what we call Sunday School Week at the Baptist encampment over in North Carolina called Ridgecrest. It was a beautiful place and we loved to go. One particular year when we were there, our church Sunday School director and I attended a fairly large meeting together, probably two or three hundred people I'm guessing from my memory now who were who were all Sunday School leaders now. These were not just ordinary people. These were people who were really involved in Sunday School, leading and teaching Sunday School. It was being taught by a man who worked for the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now keep in mind, the 1970s, I hope you remember your history, these were the years when the Southern Baptist Convention was finally waking up to the problem of what we sometimes call theological liberalism. Technically, it really wasn't theological liberalism. That's a misnomer. It was more like neo-orthodoxy. But what it meant was that many of our professors had stopped believing that the Bible was the very Word of God. They might say it contained the Word of God. But these guys were very happy just to accept a whole lot of the, what we call philosophical naturalism. And so they tried to explain away a lot of the miraculous or supernatural parts of the Bible. They would have all kinds of natural explanations. But when you start doing that, guys, what you finally discover eventually is you don't have much left. I mean, what are you going to stand on? If you take away all the supernatural, what do you have left? I mean, this Bible is a supernatural book. God is a supernatural God. Anyway, this, I don't want to go down that road right now. This man was teaching through one of the Gospels, and he came to a place where Jesus was casting out demons. And I still remember his words because they were so totally shocking to me when I heard them at that point in the 1970s. He said, now, some of you are going to want to ask me, are demons real? Well, I don't know. And furthermore, neither do you. End quote. <laughs> he just went on. And I sat there stunned. I thought, good grief. This is a Southern Baptist teacher? Now, this is pretty blatant. So, after the session was over, I grabbed my Sunday school director and said, come on, we need to go talk to this man. <laughs> so we caught up with him on his way out. 
And I said to him, just very honestly, I thought I might not have to get a chance to talk to him again. I said, sir, you don't really believe the Bible's God's Word, do you? And he frowned and said, why would you say that? And I said, well, because you said you didn't know if demons were real. And the Bible clearly teaches that they are. So the only conclusion I can make is that you don't believe the Bible's God's Word. It's fascinating. He became very red in the face. He frowned and he said angrily, you're trying to put words in my mouth. And he walked away. Now, I share that little story, which is true, by the way, to say this. Most likely, if you don't really believe the Bible, you probably won't even be listening to this series on spiritual warfare anyway. But, but if you are having any issues with trusting the Bible, we keep coming back to this, don't we? I want to urge you, get those questions in your mind settled. Don't be afraid to ask them. Ask them. Get them settled as quickly as possible. I have a lot of Veritas 2020 videos that can help you with that. I'll be glad to talk with you personally. But the Bible teaches very clearly we have real spiritual enemies, Satan and his demons. And the Bible teaches they are very real. And that's why God says we must learn to resist them, to fight them. We are in a real spiritual war. And the enemy is not people. We've been through this before. Now, Satan would love for all of us to think, oh, I'm a modern person. I think scientifically, which, by the way, most people who claim to think scientifically, who talk like this anyway, they don't really think scientifically. They just think it's nice to say. It sounds sophisticated. And all this talk about Satan and his demons is stuff from ignorant times of the distant past. We know better than that today. <laughs> now, now, listen, if Satan can get you there, if he can get you to think like that, he knows he's not going to get any resistance from you. <laughs> You'll be like putty in his hands. You're not going to resist him because you don't even believe he's there. And there are millions and millions and millions of people today who are doing exactly that. They're acting as Satan's pawns. They've, they're foolishly, they think they're sophisticated, and they're foolishly laughing at the very thought of Satan's existence. Very foolish. But God's given us armor, and these pieces of armor are listed in Ephesians chapter 6, and we've started looking at them. But listen, before we can effectively put on the other pieces of armor that God provides for us to resist the devil, we must, you hear me guys, we must make sure the belt of truth is securely in place. So important. And because God put such a premium on truth in his word, we spend a lot of time learning to put on the belt of truth about God himself. I'm tempted again to once again repeat what I've said so many times about truth, but I'll resist that temptation. I want us to think briefly about the truth now about sin, our sin so important that we understand the truth about sin. Our enemy, the devil, has succeeded in deceiving many, many people about sin. He loves to tell lies like, oh, you know, everybody does it. It's not really such a big deal, is it? Or maybe, eh, I know the Bible says it's sin, but aren't things different now? I mean, the culture's different now, right? This is okay now. It's not really sin. Oh, or if it's sin, it's very minor sin. It's a lie. Or maybe other lies like, you, you've sinned so much. You can remember your sin, right? You've sinned so much. You've sinned so badly in the past. You can't expect God to keep on forgiving you. You're not really serious. You're not really repentant or you wouldn't have done it again. You can't be useful to it now. And it's like Satan's hammering you because you're not perfect or maybe hammering you because you're being tempted to sin. Now, I, I'm not going to take much time I'm going to stop this just for a second and see if I can, sometimes I can get this, excuse me, sometimes I can get this thing to stop rattling over here if I push on the casing that's in the housing. <laughs> Doesn't want to cooperate. That may be a little better. <laughs> Drives me crazy. I'm here today talking about it more, mainly because I've talked about it at length in other places. For example, have you watched the second video of that four-part gospel series as part of the Spirit Talks 2020 series? If you haven't watched it, maybe you want to watch that right now. But it will help you understand some of the ways Satan lies to us about our sin. But when we're engaged in spiritual warfare, it's really important for us to recognize the truth about sin. Otherwise, Satan will beat us up. And it's a good thing to spend a few minutes just confessing the truth about our own personal sin so that Satan will be able to lie to us about it. For example, you might pray something like, Father, you're talking to God now. I confess the truth about my sin. I recognize that sin really is serious. 
is more serious and more ugly and more deadly than I possibly probably could ever understand or realize. But by your grace, Lord, my sin's been washed away by the blood of Jesus, what he did for me on the cross. So thank you that because of the work Jesus did on the cross, dying for my sin, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. Sin no longer has power over me. Sin is not my master. I don't have to be paralyzed by sin, present, past, or even future. You set me free. And by the way, Father, if I have any unconfessed sin in my life right now, sin that might be messing my, my fellowship with you, sin that would give Satan some kind of loophole and maybe create a snare for me, I welcome you, Father, to bring it to my mind. I don't want to overlook it. I, I want you to help me understand the seriousness of it and, and help me to understand the grace that you've given me me so that I can confess and repent of it and you will forgive me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for, for cl cleansing me of all my unrighteousness because that's exactly what he promises to do in First John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's number five. From all unrighteousness. That's the truth. That's God's word. So speaking the truth about sin is really an important part of putting on the belt of truth. We confess the truth about our sins it will frustrate some of Satan's paper deceptions, I promise you. So get it right. Get the truth in your head about your sin. Another area that I think Satan <laughs> loves to lie to us and deceive us and confuse us about is about who we are in Christ, our spiritual identity, once we become Christian. You know, in a way, you might say there are two kinds of testimony. Are you familiar with that word testimony? Most of us, when we hear the word testimony, you know what comes to our mind? I bet it's coming to your mind now if you've been raised in church. Most of us who've been in church all our lives probably think about a brother or sister in Christ maybe standing in front of a group, but in any case, they're sharing some details about their lives that demonstrate how God has worked in their lives. God's shown his faithfulness in our lives, and that becomes part of our testimony. We call that a testimony. That's very good. It's very powerful. Uh, you ought to be thinking about how to share your own personal testimony. Think about what God's done in your life personally. So you can share that with others when you get an opportunity. It's very powerful. So look for opportunities to share that kind of testimony. But there's another kind of testimony, at least in my brain there's another kind of testimony. And that's the testimony that God himself tells us is the truth about ourselves. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the truth about ourselves that we know it's true because God tells us that it's true. He's told us in his word that it's true. And by the way, you could think of this as God's answer to the self-esteem movement. If you've watched many of these videos, you know that I'm very concerned about the self-esteem movement. I've talked about it extensively in some of the Veritas 2020 videos. But I'll repeat here that the self-esteem movement is actually a satanic substitution for God's truth. The self-esteem movement wants to leave God out of the picture. It just tries to get everybody to get very confident in themselves, to think highly of themselves. You know what that leads to, don't you? Sure you do, at least to Sin is pride and arrogance. So parents, if the self-esteem movement seems like a good idea to you because you feel like your kids don't have enough confidence, I urge you, instead of building the kids' self-esteem and self-confidence, start building their Christ-esteem and Christ-confidence because the truth really is that apart from Christ, we really can do nothing. We don't need to think we can do anything on our own. We can't do anything without Jesus. But in Christ, things are very, very different. This is part of our, te our, our, our testimony. So you get it? We don't need self-esteem, guys. But we do, listen, we do need to understand and confess the truth about who we are in Christ. This kind of testimony is powerful in overcoming Satan, and it makes us more useful to God because it gives him the glory. He's the one who's done it. He gets the glory. It doesn't puff me up with pride. You see the point? Look at Revelation chapter 12. And they, he's talking about God's kids, this is number they eight. overcome him, talking about Satan. How? He mentions three things. Because of the blood of the Lamb, that's Jesus' death for us on the cross, what he did for us on the cross. And, look at this, because of the word of their testimony, they knew who they were in Christ. They understood who their identity was in Christ. And then they did not love their life, even to death, because they knew that death is not the end of things, they're going to be with Jesus after this life over anyway. So the word of our testimony, he says here, is part of what over, enables us to have victory over Satan. So, what does God tell us about ourselves once we receive the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives by faith? Well, according to God's word, now listen guys, this is God's word. 
I'm, I'm sharing a lot of God's Word with you here. This is what God says is true about us. And by the way, I'm going to put these scriptural references on the screen so you can see them right now. And you can stop and pause and think about it and pray about it if you want to. But I'll also try to remember to put a link on AboundingJoy.com when I post this so you can look them up and print them if you want to. This is God's Word. God tells me, I am a child of God. That's in Romans chapter 8. This is that long list God of number 10. God tells me 10. that all things are working together for my I'll good. I'll give you the handout in a little while. God tells me, I am an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ. He says, I am being transformed into the same image of the glory of the Lord from glory to glory. He says, I am in Christ. He says, I am a new creature. He says, I'm a citizen of heaven, and I'm redeemed, and I'm God's own purchased possession, and I'm a stranger and pilgrim here on earth. I'm an ambassador from the kingdom of God. I'm held in his hand and no one can snatch me away. God tells me that sin shall not be master over me. That I'm seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That Christ is in me. That I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. That I've been made complete in Christ. That I've been set free by the truth. I'm loved by Jesus. I have died to sin. I've been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in me. I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. God supplies all my needs according to His riches and glory. I have authority over all the power of the enemy. God will never leave me or forsake me. I'm more than a conqueror in all things. I reign in life. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I'm qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints. And I've received the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, that may seem like a long list to you. That's just a partial list. But it will get us started focusing on the truth about what God says about each of us as His kids. We need to spend some time meditating on these things in his presence as we put on the belt of truth i'm not saying you have to go over every single one every time you enter into spiritual warfare but these ought to be in the back of your mind they need to be in your heart who you are in christ you see god wants us and our kids to be filled with confidence but not confidence in ourselves the world is all about building self-confidence god wants us to have confidence in him Confidence in the truth that he's told us about ourselves. He has an awesome purpose, guys, for each of you, each one of us who have come to Christ. He's got an awesome purpose for our lives. And it's a purpose that will bring him a lot of glory. And it will bring us a lot of joy in the process. We just need to trust him with that. Trust what he says. Now, as we think about the truth about what God says about us as his kids, I'd like to make sure we understand one aspect of that truth in particular, and that's the truth about God's power in us. And this is important. He talks about it a lot in his word. You know, listen carefully to me. We need to recognize and confess the truth about the power of God that's working in and through us. And we have to be very careful. God's given us power in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. But this is not power for me just to get my way. It's not power for my will to be done. You understand? It's not power to manipulate God somehow so I can get what I want if I just push all the right spiritual buttons. I know there are people out there that teach junk like that, but this is not what God's talking about. It's not power to impress other people. It's the power to do what God has put us here to do. It's the power to do His will. It's the power to bring Him glory and to stay in that battle until the end. Oh, it's power, all right. But it's not human power, it's divine power, and it's spiritual power. And, and I want to share some of these references with you. I want to put, I'll put them on the screen so you can see them. I'll again try to remember to put a link at aboundingjoy.com so you can print them off if you want to. Now listen, this is God's Word. Don't minimize it, don't water it down. Just don't try to get selfish about it. You understand what I'm saying? It's all about Him. Okay, where is he? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. 
Acts in Acts chapter 1. I've got all these for you also on that paper. Who's able to do Number 13. Abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the what? The power that works within us. Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what? What's the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. John 14, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I'm going to the Father. 1 Corinthians 4, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. 2 Corinthians 12, My grace, God told Paul, is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. You hear that? Power is perfected in our weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, I will rather boast about my weakness. Why? That the power, the power of Christ may dwell in me. Colossians 1. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. 2 Timothy 1. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Isaiah 40. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Second Timothy 3. In the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be holding to a form of godliness that look like Christians, although they will have denied its power. The point is that we in ourselves and our own strength are very, very weak. You know that. You don't need me to tell you that, do you? But the Holy Spirit of God in us is very, very powerful. He is mighty. He is powerful. And He's able. He's able to do whatever God wants done in our lives. And that way, He, not we, He gets all, not some, all the glory. It all belongs to Him. He's the source of the power. And while we're talking about God's power in us, it's a good time to think a little bit about the truth that God gives us about answered prayer. Because again, Satan will lie to us here. We need to realize the truth and, and confess the truth with our lips about answered prayer. The best way to do this is to read God's Word. Memorize it. Read back to it. The enemy would love to convince us that prayer is useless. That it's powerless. And he'll remind you of times when you ask God for something and nothing happened. And nothing changed. You think, well, fool me on that. No point in prayer. <laughs> Satan will do anything he can to get us to doubt what God said about prayer. And you would think, well, other people may be powerful in prayer, but I'm not. I'm weak. I've tried. It doesn't work. My prayers don't get past the ceiling. I've heard that so many times. But listen, we need to pay attention to what God tells us. And I remind you again what I said earlier. Prayer, part of the power of God, of course. It's, it's not a way God's provided for us to get what we selfishly want to have. You realize we can't see into the future, right? We realize we don't really know what's best for us most of the time. It's not a way just to satisfy our human desires or our cravings. It is very simply and very beautifully the way God has provided for us to cooperate with Him. That's what we're doing in accomplishing His will here on the earth. It's very powerful. Prayer is the way God's provided to work through us. And that's why He commands us to gird our loins with the truth. The truth about him, the truth about his power, the truth about what, us, the truth about prayer. <laughs> By filling our minds with verses like these. Again, this is God's word. Second Chronicles 7. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Psalm 34, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Psalm 37, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he'll bring it to pass. Psalm 50, call upon me, God says, in the day of trouble, I'll deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm 86, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon you. 
Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Psalm 145. The Lord is near unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He'll fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He'll also hear their cry and will save them. Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Jeremiah 33. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Matthew 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. And he that seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asked bread, would he give him a stone? Or if he asked a fish, would he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give good things to them who ask him? Matthew 18, again I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 21, In all things, whatever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Mark 11, Therefore I say to you, what things whoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, you shall have them. Luke 18, He spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men are always to pray, and not to faint or quit, saying, There was in a city a judge, who feared not God, neither regarded men. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, You hear what the unjust judge said? And shall not God avenge his own elect, who cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? John 14. And wherever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 15. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. John 16. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. If it too, if you ask nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Ephesians 3. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 6. This is the spiritual warfare passage. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Philippians 4. Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5. Pray without ceasing. Verse 72. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Hebrews 4. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. James 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. It shall be given him. James 4, you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust or your pleasures or your own selfish desires. 
James 4. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 1 John 3. And whatever we ask, we receive of him because we're keeping his commandments and doing those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. 1 John 5. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desire of him. That's a lot of prayer verses, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? That's all in God's word. And again, we're not going to quote all those verses every time we put on the belt of truth, but these words need to be in our hearts and minds, and we need to water them down. The reason people water them down is because they've asked for things selfishly instead of for God's will to be done, and they didn't get what they wanted at the moment, and they just washed it up, washed their hands in prayer, which is really tragic. But there'll be times when you'll be impressed to use some of these verses. There'll be other times you'll find that you'll be impressed to use other verses, but the more them you commit to heart, to memory, the more you'll be equipped to stand against the enemy's attacks. I mean, God's serious about his word. We need to be too. Because once you memorize these kind of things, the Holy Spirit can bring them to mind when you need them. Okay. <laughs> By now, you're probably thinking, good grief, is he just going to go on and on forever talking about the belt of truth? <laughs> I guess we could, couldn't we? I mean, the truth is powerful, and there's so much more to God's truth, and Satan is such a clever liar. I hope I've made the point that we need to make sure we know the truth. We know God's truth so that we won't be taken in by Satan's deceptions and lies. And, of course, that just put us on the sidelines. We'll be totally ineffective for the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you so much for telling us so much in your word about the truth. The truth about you. The truth about us. The truth about sin. The truth about your power in us. The truth about answered prayer. And, of course, Lord, the truth about many, many other things. We could go on and on. But, Lord, help us to get really well equipped. Father, I know that some of the people who may be listening to me right now may be kind of immature in Christ, and, and they've never memorized much. Maybe some of them haven't exercised their memory muscles enough to, to think they can even do it. Maybe some of them are so old they think they can't do it. I don't know. But, Lord, I know that the more of your word and your truth we hide in our hearts, the better equipped we will be to fight off Satan. And Father, I know from experience and from testimonies of others how clever Satan is at deception, at deceiving us. So help us all to, to be able to put on that belt of truth and to wear it, not confident in ourselves, but fully confident in you, the great creator God who lives in us by the power of your Holy Spirit, works through us to accomplish your purposes, Lord. So thank you that we get to be a part of this work. Thank you that you chosen to put us into the war and help us to fight effectively and to stay in the battle until you call us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to give you two more handouts before you leave. One of them is the answers to those questions you got. Just pass those around, please. And another one is a handout that I've got. Some of this will be just duplicated, but I had one on the who we are in Jesus, our identity in Christ, and multiple truth regarding my identity in Christ. Take that one, too. You can put it with your other things. Um, and we don't have time to talk about any of this right now. But I hope you have a wonderful fall break. Do you have anything you want to add before I pray and let you go? Yes? For my science test. Science test. Yeah, we had some others asking for prayer for tests. All right. Anything else? Oh, sorry. Okay. You should be getting two more, so you'll have a bunch of them today. Okay. Okay. Everybody get, get them? Okay. That's fine. Just leave it on the table there. I'll get it. Anything else? Everybody cool? Did they get around? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Thank you so much, Lucy. Okay, Lord, we're, we're closing out this class and we're closing out this quarter. And I pray that you'd help these kids, again, take more seriously than ever before the fact that we are in a war and you commanded us to stay in the battle to stand firm against all the tactics of the enemy and to keep the armor in place. So I pray you'd help these kids learn how to do that. I know they're still in the getting equipped stage right now, but I pray they'd take it seriously. Help us, Lord, to put on that belt of truth really, really well and to frequently put on the truth about you, 
the truth about ourselves, the truth about answered prayer, the truth about uh, the power that you have in us. Uh, we just want to get the truth straight, Lord, so the enemy won't be able to deceive us about in these areas where he so easily deceives so many people. We don't want to be part of that deceived group. So help us, Lord, to, to keep your word in our hearts and in our minds and to bring you glory today in Jesus' name. Amen.